This is Six Tackles with Gus with Matthew Thompson and Gus Gould. Matthew Thompson, how are you doing? Very well, thanks. You're in Brisbane, I'm in Sydney. Yes. The wonders of modern technology. Unbelievable. You didn't even know what a podcast was not long ago. No. Now we're doing it in different cities. I'm actually at the studios of 2GB in Sydney and I used to be in, yeah, I used to, I did a little bit of work in this studio at one time. Yes, it's all I. changed it's now. It's all got cameras, very modern. You should pop up and say hello to Ray Hadley. I probably will. You can go, maybe you can be a special guest on his program this morning. I probably won't. <laughs> <laughs> any, op- any opinions on politics? <laughs> no. Yes. Keep- have you been watching the swimming? I have, yeah. Been brilliant, hasn't it? Yeah. Some top performers there. Yeah. We came frighteningly close to a world record first two nights. Um, and uh, Molly O'Callaghan and Ariana are back in the pool tonight. And the multi-class swimmers have been a highlight. I, but that's just wonderful stories that, and st- uh, victories against huge adversity. Um, it's been a, a wonderful addition to the mainstream program. It's been good to have both the, the Olympic and Paralympic teams being selected together. So uh, all the action, 7.30 prime time right throughout the week. It's beanies for brain cancer around. Gus, this has been going for, I reckon, a decade. Yep. If not a little bit more. And it's quite a personal story, actually, for us at nine, because our late colleague, Matt Callender, was the driving force behind this, in addition with the Mark Hughes Foundation. And they have raised staggering amounts of money. And they're actually making a real life difference into research, um, into the causes of, of brain cancer. And for myself, actually, this year, uh, it is even more personal because my my dear friend and colleague David Morrow, um, as many people would be aware, um, is fighting his own most serious battle. Um, he's well, he's he has stage four brain cancer, and um, he's in hospital and uh, is doing it fairly tough, but maintaining a, a stoic approach and trying to trying to stay positive, watching all the footy and doing all the things that, that he loves doing, but it is a very insidious disease, and I think it's been wonderful that Rugby League has been able to be at the forefront of the awareness and fundraising campaign for all this. certainly has. I guess all of us at some stage in our life, you know, through a relative, friends or whatever, is going to be touched by some form of cancer, and, um, you know, some they've been able through research to, to have very great success with, um, whether it's treatment or surgeries. Uh, uh, but there are certainly some that uh, are insidious and we need more money and we need more research into them and hopefully one day we can find a cure. The Calendar family have been outstanding um, mm. ever since Matthew's passing or even before his passing when he was diagnosed with the illness. Uh, these sort of um, research funding uh, efforts were made and uh, the Beanie for Brain Cancer around has become synonymous with our game now. Uh, the Mark Hughes Foundation, of course, Mark Hughes was a Newcastle first grade footballer um, who also had brain cancer and survived. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it, it is dear to our hearts and we support it wholly. And right throughout the weekend, you'll see everyone, coaches, players, staff, at press conferences uh, as they run onto the field wearing the beanies um, and it's to raise awareness so everyone gets out and buys one so we can raise enough money to keep the research going. And as you say, they are making a difference. The Mark Hughes Foundation has done wonderful things already and will continue to do so. Great man, Mark Hughes. Congratulations on the effort that you and the foundation continue to make. Round 14 takeaways, best team. Well, I'm just going to say it was the Bulldogs, Gus. <laughs> hey. It was quite a day. Well, it was a great day for the game, wasn't it? I mean, 45,000 out there at, uh, at Acor Stadium at Homebush, um, Parramatta and Bulldogs, two of our biggest clubs in Sydney. And that's how Sydney Rugby League should look. Uh, yep. Big crowds in a big stadium and a uh, wonderful day for all the fans. Uh, tremendous game of football. Not much between the two sides at all. And uh, a very, very brave effort by the Bulldogs mm. um, to come from behind despite all the adversity through the game. And um, and continue on their winning way. So it was uh, a pretty special day for our club, but I think for rugby league as well. Yeah, um, just shows that uh, if you put the games on at the right time and, and and the teams are going well, you'll draw the big crowds. The cr- crowds right across the game this year have been outstanding. I think they really have. I think people have got in love again with going out to live sport, going out to live football, and uh, and that's a very very pleasing thing about our game. The the atmosphere it creates at the game and the support for the players. Uh, and they really respond, and the players of both teams responded to that big crowd on Monday. It was a terrific game of rugby league. Yeah. The Warriors have had, 
I reckon, nine sellout crowds in a row. That's unheard of. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you, you look at the success that the Panthers have had in recent years and uh, the opening of the new Allianz Stadium and, you know, when the big clubs are playing well and getting it right and they, they play each other, there should be big crowds to these games, um, you know, and it's... Uh, it, it's great for the game. It's great atmosphere. And even for us as broadcasters, when you go to a ground that's full and you have that as- atmosphere and it's palpable and, mm-hmm. and the games are close, there's nothing like it. That's what. That's how you fall in love with sport. It's how I fell in love with this sport. Honestly, it's how I fell in love with this sport was going to games taken by my father and it mm-hmm. was the crowd and the noise and the colours and the jerseys, you know, because back then it was black and white TV. You never got, you never got that sensation when you were watching TV watching sport on TV, you had to go to the grounds to experience it. And, and that's what I fell in love with. I fell in love with the colour and the and the crowd and the atmosphere at games and, and that's why you wanted to be a player. What was your favourite ground when you were a kid? Back in the day? Well, yeah. we were Dragons supporters, so yeah. we would jump on the train every weekend and go to wherever the Dragons played. Yeah. <clears throat> so we spent a lot of time at Cogra Jubilee, uh, which yeah. was a, uh, a favourite of ours on the hill at Cogra Jubilee. Um, I remember every other Sunday we'd go to the... the the Cumberland Oval, the old Cumberland Oval, and uh, <laughs> and watch Parramatta play. Uh, the the big ground in those days was the Sydney Cricket Ground. That's where yeah. the match of the day was played. Uh, every weekend there was a match of the match of the day that was moved to the big ground at the Sydney Cricket Ground, and um, uh, and that's where the finals were played. That's where the big matches were played. So uh, mm-hmm. everything was played on the neutral venue in finals time. The, uh, the the goal was to get to the semi finals and go and play at the Sydney Cricket Ground. That was the big thrill. It was a neutral ground. Of course, it was just a Sydney competition back in those days. So, you know, probably Jubilee, um, uh, the SCG, they were uh, they were the ones that we spent our most of our time at. Yeah, and so I've heard some some older players that you sort of talk to around the trap say they used to hate going to play at Cogra. Well, you couldn't it. you couldn't win there. <laughs> it was a it was a good story because Dad, we I was born in Tempe, Newtown, and Dad was a Newtown supporter. Yes, Dad was station. working in the police force at Newdown Police Station. And my first ever game of rugby league was at Henson Park. He took me to Henson Park to watch the Blue Bags play. And he used <laughs> he to He could do... have arrested half the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> well he could have. <laughs> I think back in those days Newdown was either criminals or coppers, one or the other. They were all playing all together. All coexisting. <laughs> they were all playing together in the same colours. Um, yeah, so uh, and he took me one day because he had a, a, his best mate who he worked with in the police force, a black called Brian Chickamore. Brian oh, Chickamore yeah. was a kangaroo tourist in 1967 and played for the New Down Blue Bags and one of the famous New Down uh, Blue Bags of all time, New Down mm. Jets these days. And uh, Chicka was often at our house for dinner um, a couple of nights a week and we used to live in a little one-man police station at Tempe <laughs> yes. as, as where we lived. And uh <laughs> So this day, Dad said, we're going, we're going out to Cogra Oval to watch Chicka play against the Dragons. Mm-hmm. He said he's going he's to mark up against Reg Gaznier and he's going to give it oh. to Reg Gaznier. <laughs> oh, wow. So, so, so we went out. He, he, the first time I ever went to Cogra Jubilee, he took me out and we sat on the hill to watch the Newdown Blue Bags play the St. George Dragons. And St. George won, I think, 44-3 to three or something. I'm not a Dragons <laughs> fan from that day. So he, he lost me. <laughs> He lost me as a New Down fan. Um, uh, I stuck. So with the Brian winners. Chick Chicken Moore didn't give it to Reg Gaznier. <laughs> no, he didn't. <laughs> Flat out catching him. <laughs> he was Very a good. good. Player. It was a good player, Chicken. He went on. Uh, he went on a yeah, kangaroo tour. I've heard a lot he about him. A tough man. Tough, tough man. Coached, coached the New Down Jets many, many years later. I think mm. in their last year in the competition, nineteen eighty three, when they were out of yeah, Campbelltown. Right. Um, yeah, wonderful man. Um, uh, yeah, great, great memories. But I, from that day on, I was a, I was a Dragon fan. So I went with the strength. And as you say, people didn't like going to Cogra Jubilee because you often came away with the same sort of scoreline. Mm. They were a great side back in the 60s and 70s. Gus, question number one. New South Wales will carry it back on the bench for game two. Yes! Yeah, I think they will. Uh, okay. I think they will. Well, I'll certainly have someone that can specialise in those positions or play other positions. Um, I think had Connor Watson been fit for game one, he would have been a certainty on the bench. Yeah, you've been saying that. And I say he's I see he's been named for the Roosters this weekend. Yep. Uh, if he came through that game, I wouldn't be surprised if he gets a start on the bench uh, for Origin 2. He was one of the ones that I thought would be a shock selection. People wouldn't see that coming. 
um, for Origin 1, but he got injured just before the, the side was announced. Um, the other option is Matt Burton was 18th man for Origin 1. He too can cover the halves and outside backs, uh, which would be handy. Uh, so do you, do, you think, do you think Watson, are you saying Watson because his ability to cover hooker? Hooker, halves, yeah. he, he'd virtually play anywhere. Connor yeah. Watson could play anywhere. But it, but him, as opposed to Burton, as the as the utility. Well, you probably the, probably yeah. Connor Watson covers hooker, lock, yeah. half, five, eight, and yeah. then he could, you know, he could move to the centre, or they could still get Hudson Young to cover that position, or a Crichton, or what have you, you know. Okay. Um, Burton is probably more specialist in outside backs and halves. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know how they're going to cover hooker. If some if something happened to the hooker, it would probably have to be a Connor Watson if he was on the bench. If Burton was on the bench, that doesn't cover hooker, unless they move one of the halves there. Um, yeah, look, there's a lot of questions to be answered about the selection of this side, but I do think they'll cover. They'll keep adequate outside back cover on the bench for yeah. this game. They won't be caught short twice, and hmm. it uh, it certainly helped Queensland, didn't it? They saw it coming. Hmm. Well, it, it's. The, the Cobo thing, you've always talked about eighty-minute players on the bench. There, there's your example. He's he's on after seven or eight minutes. Plays plays the whole game in the outside backs and a specialist. Yeah, you know, he could have yes, played right. wing, centre, fullback. They moved Hamaso to fullback, uh, which was extremely dangerous too. But yeah, uh, we we said going into to game two that there was a stat building in our game about uh, club sides, not covering specialist outside back positions from the bench and what their record was if someone went down early in games. And Billy Slater pointed to the fact that four of the last five origin games, an outside back has gone down, uh, for a HIA or, or, or an injury. Um, so they just covered it. And if you've got 80 minute players on the bench and in your side, then, you know, if someone's got to put their hand up and play 80 minutes in the forwards or in the front row, you shouldn't be worried about that. That's, yeah. That's the test of origin. That's the sort of player you want out there. Yeah. Um, and Queensland got it right. You know, they had the unfortunate injury to Reese Walsh, and uh, but it certainly they didn't lose stride, did they? Uh, Hammerso to fullback, Cobo to centre, and uh, mm. that is carried on. Is Walsh going to be okay for Origin? I'd imagine so. Yeah, he'd okay. certainly be cleared by then. He's not playing this week, but I'd imagine he'd be right to go go straight into uh, to game two. The Tigers need to spend big to keep Lachlan Galvin. No, 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 no. No, I don't think they need to spend, spend big. Uh, Lachlan Galvin's 18 years of age. L- Lachlan Galvin should not be playing NRL at the moment, particularly not in that team, in that club. Hmm. Um, I think that's far too big a ask for a boy that age. Um, I actually got to meet Lachlan a couple of weeks ago. I'd never met him before. Um, and, and he's young. Not at the Chinese restaurant at Canterbury Leafs Club. <laughs> well, he, he was at Canterbury Leafs Club, actually. Oh, was he? Yeah, he's... Breaking uh, news. <laughs> no. He came over to visit uh, Luke Vella, who's one of our assistant NRL coaches. He's his, oh. Was his teacher at school. Oh. Actually, we just came over to see him and I spotted them in the cafe. Oh, yeah, that's a good smoke screen. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, he's, he's very young. He's obviously extremely talented. He's going to be a very, very good player. I don't see what the rush is. I don't see why, you know, he has to be pushed into these positions, particularly with the team so under strength at the moment. I don't think it does young people any good whatsoever. Um, but you know, I'm not running the West Tigers, and I'm not I'm not in their position. They're they're obviously you know, in a difficult position at the moment. But he did uh, start the season well, though, in a team that was going a bit better. Would would you would you think in those circumstances they've got to be aware of of, of what's happening on the field and maybe. You know, start give him a start and then put him back down the New South Wales Cup or so manage him in that respect? Is that what you're getting at? Well, you've got to keep managing it, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that he wouldn't have got a debut this year. He wouldn't have played at several games, but back to back to back to back and playing with injury and yeah. uh, particularly with the way the team's performing at the moment, it's a it's a huge ask. And it's, um, you know, and I don't, I don't know what the circumstances are behind him requesting a release. And I understand he's requested a release on several occasions. Um, and I don't know what the future might hold there, but I do know that the bloke in charge of the West Tigers, Shane Richardson, won't be letting him go. He's got a solid contract there, so he'll be holding on to him for as long as he can. Now, if to try and appease that situation, Shane Richardson extends his contract and upgrades him. If he upgrades him, they'll want an extension. They'll want more years on the end of it. 
and mm. I think that could well be a sticking point. So, um, yeah. Uh, sticking point from I don't, the I don't think I don't think an 18-year-old kid should be going through this. I don't, I don't understand why there's all this kerfuffle about it. Um, you know, he's in the very early stages of his career. He's still developing. Uh, I think he just should be sitting tight. And I think West Tigers should be look, managing his game time and managing his progression and getting the side a little bit stronger over the next 12 or 18 months um, so that there's not such a burden on him and uh, and look after his development from there. I, mm. I it's a worry, though, that he and, and Stefano feel like Feel feel like they're almost forced to look elsewhere because they want to play a successful team. That that seems a, that seems problematic. Yeah, well, they were they were in both cases they were both happy to sign the contracts when they were. Yeah, um, you know, Leo, you can't suddenly just walk out on your club because it's performing poorly. That's not a reason to to move clubs. Um, and Stefano could be a big help in in trying to resurrect that club and get it back out of the cellar where it is at the moment. Um, you know, they've got a long way to go. They've got a lot of developing to do and uh, they've got a lot of work to do. Benji Marshall's got a lot of work to do. Uh, it's not an enviable position to be in, but uh, as I said on 100% footy the other night, Shane Richardson's very experienced in the game and he'll have a plan. It will feel like they're going backwards for a while. Uh, I've been through this before myself. and uh, But, you know, as long as there's a plan down the track, you'll hope that you, you have some blue skies in future years. Uh, it doesn't help the club, though, to have talented players like this publicly. The perception is that they want out. Now, I don't know whether that's legitimate yeah. or not. I don't know how. I mean, we only go by what we read in the media, and I take away two and divide by two. And um, it's it's not good. It's not a good look for the club to have that going on. Um, but, you know, hopefully they, they sort it out. They're two very, very talented players, though. Um, yeah. I I can't understand how any club would put terms in a contract that the player could leave if they don't make the eight or if he doesn't make Origin a couple of times a year. I, I just don't it's understand bizarre. those clauses at all, yeah. which has now left them in a quandary. The club's made a significant offer to him to remove those clauses and, and sign for five years. But as I understand it, he's not jumping at that right at the moment. He may well do um, in the, in the coming weeks. We don't know. Um, but you know they need to quieten down all that noise and and pull together and uh, the only way they're going to get out of it is sticking together. It's it's not a good time for the club. I was calling the footy with the big barn and gal on the weekend for the continuous call team, and Daryl Brayman said on air Clint Gutherson is one of the best club players he's ever seen. So my question to you, Gus, Clint Gutherson is one of the great club players. Yes. Yeah, he certainly is. What a competitor. A wholehearted competitor, uh, tough, resilient, uh, obviously talented, skillful, but passionate. I mean, I think it's obvious to everyone who watches him play. He's passionate about what he does. He's passionate about his team, his teammates. He's passionate about the result. He fights for everything. Like he, he's, um, you know, <laughs> I see a lot of comment about he's constantly challenging the referee and he's he's up arguing with the referee, you know, before the game, half time, on the way off the field, on the way on the field, and even after full time. <laughs> well, he's, that's his case. He's competitive. He wants to, he's looking for every edge that he can get. You know, he's a wonderful leader and it's made a big difference to Parramatta. Parramatta went through a terrible period there this year uh, with some awful results. I kept saying that as soon as Moses gets back, it's going to be different and it has been. Uh, but it's also coincided with Gutherson coming back into the side and um, they're far more competitive now. Uh, they'll win a, a lot more games between now and the end of the season. Mm. Um, but, yeah, as a club player, you couldn't want for anything else. He's one of those fellows that everyone wants to play with. Everyone hates playing against. And the crowd, you know, when they go out to watch players like that, that's what they want to see. They want to see people who love what they do, who love the club, who love playing for it, who, who are competitive and who never give up and fight for every inch. And when you go out to watch Clint Gutherson, it's the same every week. He doesn't do it every now and then. He doesn't do it for a little while. He does it every minute on every play in every game. And mm. uh, uh, he's been a wonderful servant for Parramatta. You'd hate to play tennis against him. You'd hate to play anything against him. He'd argue the toss. He would, yeah. he would argue everything. 
Uh, Para versus Roosters Saturday night, 7.30. We'll have a look at that game soon. Gus, I had a look at the um, City Morning Herald online, so the nine press around the country. Christian Nicolucci, the headline, as they often are, very deceiving, says Maguire Mitchell to meet 24 hours before coach picks origin team. I'm thinking, oh, he's organised a meeting. He's going to gauge if Latrell's fair income. Turns out they're going to spend the day together at the club's 10-year premiership reunion at South Juniors. (laughs) 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 They've sucked me right into that one. Right. But I suppose if... It's origin time. Everyone's looking for an angle. (laughs) Everyone's got to write a column, so they're all looking for an angle. Look, uh, we've talked about Latrell to we're blue in the face. There's no doubt he's a game-breaker, but I suppose where I'm coming from here is that Maguire had a, a certain approach that he wanted to he wanted to adopt ahead of this series. The first game hasn't gone their way. Does he throw the baby out with the bathwater? A, a, a couple of times, Freddie made mass changes in recent years from games one to two and actually came up with a result. Are you expecting him to wipe the slate or do you think he's going to stick solid? I really don't know. I mean, I've got no insight or intel on that. Uh, one train of thought is that and I said this again on 100% footy the other night, is that the fact that they were reduced to 12 men after seven minutes, they might fall on that crutch a little bit to say that things could have been different if we still had 13 men, therefore we'll stick by this side, we'll replace Suali'i and and anyone else who's injured, but we'll go with the same team and back our philosophy. Now, the philosophy leading into the game, it was a game, it was a team that was picked on Virtually statistics on week-in, week-out numbers that players produce um, uh, in attack and defence to get a work ethic into the team that they felt could match Queensland for effort, could match them for energy, uh, that would be strong defensively. um, And, you know, obviously they had some changes to what they thought the original side would have looked like because Cleary went down and Moses went down and Nico got his start at seven and there were other players that were unavailable. Um, you know, whether the Cameron Murrays of this world would have made the side, we don't know. It's just that was what they ended up with. And they were quite confident going in. I think they worked very hard on Camp 1 on those features, on work ethic and toughness and never give up attitude. And to all intents and purposes, that's what they produced. They were very brave and they, they tried really hard and they worked hard. They were just beaten 38-10 to 10 by a classy football team that were too quick and too skillful for them. Now... We can rest back on the 12-man thing. My thought on that is that we looked vulnerable even before Sue Lee went off. We'd well, already you, cons- you made that pretty plain last week when we spoke. You, you, you were concerned. Yeah. Well, I think anyone who listened to the podcast last week pre-game, whilst I tipped the blues, uh, would have been <laughs> thinking, gee whiz, he's quite worried about this Queensland. He's quite worried about the New South Wales side. And I was. Yeah, I'm cheering for them. I want them to win. And I want to support the people that are in charge today and what they're doing. Um, But to me, football-wise and, can I say, origin-wise, it just looked like Queensland had distinctive edges in important areas and would be far more settled and far more cohesive, far more dangerous and have far more points in them. And that's how Mm. it turned out. Now, in the first seven minutes, they scored a try down the right-hand side on on last play, which was a... Pretty soft origin try. They're, they're the was. sorts of things that you don't concede in that area. And when Sue Ali'i is dragged in on Reese Walsh and, and the, the, the high tackle occurs, hannah has gone straight through that hole. That's where I said they'd be attacking a lot of the time. Um, to have Lomax, Sue Ali'i, who I don't think's a representative class centre, and he plays left centre with his club. Mm. So you had Lomax, Sue Ali'i and Nico Hines on debut Mm. three players that have never played together before. They're all on debut together. It was obvious that's going to be one of the areas that Queensland would focus some of their attack, and they couldn't wait to get to them. So when Sue Lee makes the tackle, when he makes his read and hands it the way he thought he should, um, Hamaso was gone. He ran 50 metres down there and, uh, and had already split them, and I think that was going to happen for a lot of the night. I don't Personally, I don't think the score would have been much different. Oh, even right. if New South Wales had 12 men. Now, they very bravely fought on from that and actually were first to score in the second half. Both New South Wales tries came from kicks, mm. um, both when it sort of got to the end of a set of six that it wasn't going all that far. We never really looked dangerous on any other occasions. We bravely defended. I think that you know Queensland 
Um, came out in the second half. You know, it's hard sometimes when you're playing against 12 men and you've got a good lead like that. You know, where do we go from here? But um, but in the latter stages, the effort told and the fatigue told and Queensland ran away with it and, mm. and put a big score on them. Now, um, I had fears. It was interesting before the game, I was listening to all the Channel 9 team give their tips and everyone tips with their heart. Everyone tips, you know, all the Queenslanders tip Queensland. And all the New South Wales people tip New South Wales. And we all say New South Wales by two, New South Wales by four. And the Queenslanders say, yeah, Queensland by four, Queensland by six. Cameron Smith said Queensland 32-10. Right. Just, just came straight out and said it. He said Queensland 32-10. He said, I don't even think this will be close. Wow. So he was reading it pretty much as I was reading it pre-game. He, his confidence was my fears um, leading into mm. that contest. So, so he, wouldn't, he wasn't far wrong. No, he wasn't. He Should wasn't. get him to fill out my footy tab ticket. Yeah, well, he certainly. Uh, he was very. Con he just. I don't even think this will be close. He said. I think they'll run away with it in the end. Okay. And so with that, with that being said, and Brad faced this scenario in recent years as well. Lose game one, you've got no option but to to win game two. And on a couple of those occasions, he made mass changes, knowing that he's got to he's got to pick a different football team that has to go out there and and win the game. They, they can't they can't sit there and. And get in the trenches. So this is where the Mitchell thing comes in. What? Who else? Who else? And look, you were worried about their ability to score points. So who? Who, who else? Who are attacking options for New South Wales to try and sharpen that attack? Well, there aren't too many options. My biggest concern is that we conceded thirty-eight points. Uh, I know that we need to score points as well and fight fire with fire. Uh, it'll be interesting to see who the halfback is. Um, you know, one of my fears with Nico Hines, and I look, Nico Hines is a great player, terrific club player, and he really suits the Cronulla Sharks. His style of play, the way he plays halfback, um, is a little unique. It's a little different. It's certainly uh, personal. Uh, the lines that he runs, the way that he does it, where he gets the ball, where he bobs up on the field, how he floats across the field, and he virtually taunts the defence to make a decision which he'll react to. Uh, now, he trains with the likes of Teague Wilton and Nakora and Talakai and you know, Kennedy every week, and they read him and they know where it is going. They understand the structure, and they suit each other brilliantly. It, you know, they've got a great combination going there. They've been playing together for years. My fear was that when Nico came into the New South Wales side, how would he play? Would he still play with the same sort of pattern, and how would that suit the other players in the team? Would the other players in the team ask him to play like a Nathan Cleary, for example, or to play something that suits to their strengths? Or could they be able to read Nico, in, and particularly under pressure? When, when you get into these origin teams and origin games, under pressure you're going to resort to kind. Players mm. are creatures of habit. They are creatures of habit. They do the same things every week in the same circumstances pretty much all the time. Um, so you're going to resort back to that, even if you've trained a different way for that week. I just didn't feel at any time during the game that we were building to anything or that we had. Um, and I felt like Nico got stranded a number of times because of that and was a little uh, hesitant, a little confused. And they, they just wasn't, they weren't in sync. They weren't together. They weren't connected in what they were doing. And you that's didn't understandable. For the first few days. But that, that was contrary to everything Michael Maguire said to bring the halfback in that can't run with them for the first few days. Yeah. You're on the back foot from the outset, aren't you? Everyone wants that to happen. Every, every coach wants, everyone want, coach wants everyone available. He wants everyone to train every session. You know, they've all got what they want. You don't get it. Yeah. You don't get it in origin. You don't get what you want in origin. Players are going to come in that can't train. Players are going to come in that need rehab and need resting. It's just as simple as that. It's but the halfback to take him in, knowing he can't train. Well, what was the other option leading into game one? Luan Kiri. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I don't think anyone was tipping Luke Kiri to be the Origin halfback at any. Well, I think Luai was going to be the half. But anyhow, so Mo Moses. Look, I think most people expect Moses to be picked, and you've often spoken about that maturing. Uh, halfback, you know, the age bracket, but he's 29 now and he, he looks like he's in the sweet spot of his career. And in fact, it's probably, assuming he's picked, it's sort of his chance to really stand up on this stage, actually. What you need in that position, more than anything else, right, what you need is leadership and confidence. Yeah. They're, they're the two factors you need straight away. 
Yeah. You need someone that believes in themselves and, and, and knows exactly what he wants. And there is no question as to how we're going to play. We will play to what that leader says. That's what we will do. Now, I wasn't in Origin Camp. I haven't heard anything out of Origin Camp. I've only watched them play. But I, I didn't see leadership and confidence hmm. in the way we constructed our attack. Maybe that should be Jerome Luai who has done really well for Panthers in that number seven jersey. He's been bought by the West Tigers as a number seven going forward because he feels at this stage of his career he's ready to stand up and run sides. I think I said on this podcast a month ago, you said, who would I pick? Yeah. I said, from those available, I would pick Luai at half and Burton at six, only because that's a personal thing. If I was coaching, I could trust them, I believe in them, and I know we, we could get a game on that they would believe in and they'd be confident about I just didn't feel the leadership and the confidence in in the New South Wales side. Our captain only played twenty odd minutes. Like we, the whole team, to me, just lacked lacked confidence in what it was doing. It worked really hard. They played their hearts out. They tried as hard as they could. They never gave up. Hmm. But you know, Origin's more than that. That those things are given. So in our halfback role, whoever they pick for game two, the two special qualities you need are leadership and confidence. And we need someone that's going to come in and say, this is how we're playing and this is where we're going. Now, for me at the moment, if you look around the league, uh, Jerome Luai can do that. Mitchell Moses can do that. If Jerome Luai plays seven, then what are your options at six? Right, the most likely one is probably Burton. Um or Akiri, uh, not many others at the moment. So would you go with the two you, you said a month ago, or would you would you have Moses with Luai? That's me personally. That, 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 you, you're that's still me of that, personally. You're still of that thought. I'm not saying that's what they should do at all. But you're but still of the Luai Burton thought. If I, if I had to coach the side, if I had to coach the side and I was going into camp, I'd be yep. very, very comfortable with Luai and Burton. Okay. I, I, would, I would go into camp saying, okay, I've got confidence in this. They're good leaders. They know what they're doing. We can get this game on and we can bring the rest of the team to light. What about other the trail? factors that the team is going to need. But, um, you know, I, I felt also, um, you know, Reese Robinson is a great kid and he tries really hard. I just yeah. I could not understand not having Appy Corso as a part of that squad. Yeah. Who gives you what? Leadership, hmm. confidence. Right? He gives you leadership and confidence. He, you and know, skill with the ball. Well, yeah, they're the lot, they're the nice to haves, but in those positions, leadership and confidence. Yeah. You know, like, do you think Ben Hunt gives leadership and confidence to Queensland? Do you cool. think Cherry Evans gives leadership and confidence to Queensland? Mm. That's what you're looking for. So, if I'm looking at those positions, that's okay. Apart from the game plan and the talent and the kick and the pass and everything else, I want someone that believes they should be there and believes that they can get it done. Mm. And that's, yeah. you know, and, and Nico's got to graduate to that. You know, if he can get Cronulla into the finals again and win a few games or get them to a grand final or win a premiership, Cronulla are about out of the finals in the last two years when they've got there. You know, mm. he, needs, he needs to grow confidence and belief in himself to give confidence and belief to the team. Mm. You know, now, out of game one, has, he, has, has game one helped him or hurt him? I don't know. I don't know Nico. I, I don't talk to Nico. I've got no idea. Has that been a, a good experience for him or has it been a bad experience for him? Is that going to steal him for what happens in Wednesday fortnight or is it going to be a nightmare he doesn't want to relive? I don't know. You've got to ask Nico. That's for the coach to decide. He knows them better than me. I'm just, mm. I'm like you. I'm looking from the outside in. But these are all the things you've got to take into account because it's, it's as, it's as much a mental battle as anything going into these games. Yeah. What do we, what, what, yeah. what, what, what are we doing now about the captaincy going forward? Well, this is an interesting factor. Um, and everyone loves Jake Trebojevic. Every, even if you're a Queenslander, you love Jake Trebojevic. But to, to play 20 minutes, come on, start the game, and not come back as captain, uh, I mean, where does that leave him? And where does that leave the coach having appointed a new captain? He, he's saying there's extenuating circumstances with the send-off and juggling players, etc. But 
gee, it's, it seems hard. It seems strange that you get tw- well, 29 minutes out of your captain in game one. Mm. Well, I, I don't know what the interchange plan was for the night. I mean, they probably had a plan. Uh, I don't know that we responded to the send-off uh, as well as or as quickly as we could have, and maybe that's probably something they didn't plan for, but it took them a long while to find a solution to Sawerly being off and then being down to 12 men. How that affects your front row rotation, I don't know, or how you intended to use your captain or why you named him captain for that game. Uh, that I that I don't understand. Now, they might have a reason. I felt like they had a plan for the interchange and they went about the same plan anyway. I don't know how much it changed during the game. Uh, for me, Hudson, well, what they advertised was Hudson Young was going to be the outside back replacement if an outside back went down. He's presidedly a left-sided player. Um, it took ages to move Crichton over to the right where the problems were. And I, and I felt, even leading into the game, I felt that Nico Hines needed Crichton more than Luai needed Crichton, you know, to start the game. You know, Nico Hines in between Lomax and... and, and uh, between Lomax and Nico Hines. Getting Crichton in between Lomax and Nico Hines made more sense to me than mm. just trying to play Crichton and Todd together. That's a little bit too cliche, you know. I think uh, Jerome Luai... Uh, could have helped Suwali on that left-hand side, where he plays in at his club level. You know, and the fact that he plays left for his club all the time was one of the factors why the tackle went wrong for him on the right-hand side of the field, because he hit with the wrong shoulder anyway. Yeah. I don't want to go into the mechanics of the tackle, but you know, if if you put in these pressure situations and you're out of your comfort zone and out of your position, that's where things can go wrong. That's that's unfortunately what happened on the night. Um, but they get into game two, clean slate, it's nil all, it's a game they've got to win, it's a neutral venue down in Melbourne. I've said to you, the team that wins in Melbourne will win the series. Mm. I did say New South Wales couldn't lose game one and win the series, well, I'm hoping they can. It'll be very, very... <laughs> one of them's going to be right. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be very, very interesting to see the team that they come up with. I, I, you know, from what I know, what little I know of Michael Maguire, and I, I, haven't, I haven't had a lot to do with him, I've got to be honest, but um, he seems like a fairly... Um, persistent character. He seems like a fairly dogmatic character. Mm. Uh, I doubt that he's going to expose himself as being so wrong for game one that he makes mass changes. This was the team he picked. He picked it on a certain philosophy. I think he'll stick by it. And all power to him if he does. And the players would appreciate that. Whatever togetherness or connectivity or belief in each other and, hey, hey, we're going to hold hands and we're all blues and we're going to do this and that, if you turn around and just drop them all after game one, well, then that really didn't mean anything, did it? You know, I, I, I was never one to really want to change your side once it started the series. Uh, and you kind of start again, don't you? Well, what, whatever benefit they've got out of camp one, whatever benefit they got out of playing together, <clears throat> if it's lost, if you've got to bring in a new combination. Now, it's differently. It, it's different if you're bringing in, you know, experienced origin performers Yes. Right, experienced origin winning performers. So if you can change your side and you bring those sort of fellas in, of course it's going to improve your side. Yeah. And I do think Mitchell Moses will get picked. Yeah, I do too. Uh, and, and if he does, I think that's going to change the whole dynamic of, of, of the side. He brings you a kicking game, doesn't he? Like that big long kick and... He brings you <laughs> leadership and he brings you confidence. Hmm. That'll carry over into the kicking game. That'll carry over into the direction. Right? That'll be... Um, he won't need protecting in defence. He's 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 been there a few times before. Now he's played in big games. He's thirty years of age for God's sake. Like he's yeah. he's been in the game a long time. Now, uh, yeah, obviously we'd love to have Nathan Cleary available. We haven't got that, um, but I think Mitchell Moses is the next big, best option. So I've heard on Cleary some whispers that if New South Wales New South Wales can win in Melbourne, it's not. It's not beyond the realms he might be available for game three at Suncorp. Well, he should be. <laughs> he should be. I, I don't think he's far what? away from playing for Panthers. What about that for a story? I'll be surprised if he doesn't play for Panthers the weekend after this. Really? Ooh. All might not be lost for New South Wales. It depends, now, obviously... depends how they're going. I suppose they've had a good win again the other day, and I, I guess they're managing their their loads and their and their results during the, the origin period as they do so well these days. But... Uh, I guess they're not in any hurry to get him back because they're still winning games. But 
If he got one under his belt before game three, you'd certainly be picking him. Well, Luai's been enormous at halfback for them. Uh, we're obviously talking at, we're obviously talking about New South Wales because of Gus's background, but one thing that did sort of stand out to me just calling the game and, and thinking about it subsequent, that Queensland team is so connected. I mean, that's the buzzword now, but they are totally in control of their game. It's an, it's an established combination that obviously Billy has, has cultivated beautifully, but and you're talking about leadership and confidence that they get, they are such, they are such a unit, aren't they? With Cherry Evans at the forefront of all of that. Absolutely. Well, Cherry Evans and Ben Hunt. Yeah. You know, like um, Harry Grant is an 80-minute player. He could play 80 minutes at Origin any time he likes. Hmm. But the security blanket of having Ben Hunt there hmm. to start the game and make sure they get off on the right foot and make sure that. You know, um, if Munster wasn't there this time, well, that's okay. We've got Sherry Evans. We've got Ben Hunt. Didn't you just come in and you do your thing, mate? You're a great Queenslander. You're going to be a great Queenslander. We love you. You just do your thing. We'll tap into you. We'll go from there. This is how we want to play. Um, and Cherry Evans, you know, makes sure he gets it when he needs it. And didn't does his thing. Uh, you know, they just come into that side and they feel so comfortable. The the thing that scares you is the athleticism and the speed of the outside backs. Um, Reese Walsh at fullback, uh, as I've said, he was a superstar and he, he, he's so creative. Well, he was gone after seven minutes. First touch with the ball, he's created a, he's created a, a line break for Hamaso. Hamaso goes to fullback. Well, crikey, X factor. He, yeah. He's almost he's the most dangerous player in the game. Hamaso with his speed, he's, frighteningly he's quick. dynamite. Frighteningly quick. Oh. Frighteningly quick. And, and that speed threatens. Oh. Speed threatens every, every time you. If you're playing against a team that has real speed in those key positions, it threatens you. It, it intimidates you. There's no risk in the world. I, I look, speed worries me more than size and strength and skill and all those other factors. Oh, if they've got, on. if they're really quick, uh, that's that's the thing that worries me the most. And you know what? What is it about these blokes that are and and women that are just frighteningly fast that they don't even look like they're running quick. Like when Hamaso was supporting that break up field, it's like he was on it's like he was on a treadmill just going for a casual walk. What about Usain Bolt when you broke all those world records? It's like you're waiting for him to you're waiting for him to really click into gear. Yeah. It's like they're just loping. Yeah, that's that's the athleticism. It, it's Winks. Yeah, you know, I've I've said for many, many years and it's um, rugby league is, is not a game of endurance, it's a game of speed endurance. You've got to be very fast for a long time. You've got to be able to find f- speed out of fatigue. You've got to be able to Beyond the pace of the game and the to and fro of the game and up and down and back and forward and, and colliding with uh, three times your own body weight a number of times during a game. You've got to go through all these sort of physical things. Then you've got to find speed. You've got to find speed when you need it. And they're the scary ones. They're the ones that scare me the most. There's sometimes no defence to that. Whether they're chasing a kick or they're getting to a support position or, uh, you know, if they get free space in front of them, you just don't catch them. And Hammerso is one of those players. You know, Xavier Coates, look at the run that he made. He came up with the fastest GPS run of the game where he chased the Cherry Evans um, intercept and grubber kick. Came from a mm. mile away to get there to the end goal and score the try. And yeah. that's what they'll do. Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're a very, very good side. Of, as I said to you, it was, it was real maroon DNA in that team. Uh, no nonsense, hard-working forwards. The experience in the playmaker positions, Hunt and, uh, and Cherry Evans and uh, you know, creativity there. And then... These electrifying athletic outside backs, and the thirty-five-year-old gets better. The match, he just gets better and better. Gus, I have to salute you. That's not a field goal. That's a miracle. <laughs> That's a miracle. How long have you been keeping that one up your sleeve for? Good on your Rabs. <laughs> Good on your Rabs. Well, we've got a decider in the women's series in Townsville. We want a decider at Suncorp in the men's as well. I was. That was a compelling game of footy. That was yeah. awesome. I can't tell you how difficult the conditions were. It was freezing. I mean, my bones are still cold <laughs> from working up there on the on the night. Uh, we sat on the panel after the game in the freezing cold out there. The wind was blowing up our backs and raining on the back of us as we were, yeah. we were doing the post match uh, uh, panel there. But um, and there was water lying all over the field. Like it rained the whole time it was up there. And the skill level, the control, the competitiveness of the game. I thought athletically New South Wales were better for most of it. They were in front for most of it. They looked the likely winners for most of it. Queensland just found a way to keep hanging in there, hanging in there, hanging in there, 
were able to create a try to get back to 6-4, couldn't kick the goal. Then when New South Wales scored to extend the lead to 10-4, I thought, well, that might be a bridge too far. Queensland, as they always do, kept playing right to the 80th minute. They found a try, kicked the goal, got to 10 all. And from that moment, you could sort of feel the shift. There was no shift in momentum at all during the game. It always looked like New South Wales were in control. Mm. But the moment it got to 10 all, I felt Queensland will win this. And they found a way. The drop goal was incredible. because That was a great kick. The, the, the field was waterlogged. I mean, to drop the ball and get it to actually bounce. And it, and she kicked it flat. It never went like a traditional end over yeah. end kick. It went flat. And she kicked it into the breeze. So it kind of went flat and then it lifted a little bit, you know, just to soar above the, the, the crossbar and get over. Phenomenal kick. She will never forget that for the rest of her life. No way. Phenomenal kick to win the game. And, and Laura to take Brown down too, to for perspective, she was picked in the centres. And then she had to move to hooker because it changes. So it's a total yeah. change in her approach. And she puts herself in the frame to kick the field goal. Yeah. Well, Super these, stuff. These girls playing in this origin have all been part of the NRLW for a few years now. And their improvement, their their physical presence, their, their, their size, their strength, their stamina, their speed, their skill level, their passing. Oh. The kicking has improved so much. Uh, the tackling techniques, the structure of their play. To play in that game in those conditions and produce the standard of football they did was absolutely yeah. outstanding. Like Brilliant. Full credit to them. That and was, I reckon great. we've covered a lot of women's footy together in the last few years. I reckon that's the high point the other night. And you talk about structure. They are so brilliantly organised. It's just it's it's just wonderful. Yeah. Uh, and the women's game is absolutely on the up and up. You well, wouldn't when believe you, it. When you say we've hit the high point, the high point's in a couple of weeks' Well, time. indeed. Yeah. We're going to get the, to it. So, you know, they're just going to create a new a new peak. You know, the, the audience that we got for that, uh, the interest that it created. You know, last year they had a two-game series and I got criticised because I bagged the concept of a two-game series and said we should have three games. I offered to put it on a Belmore Oval. I said, <laughs> come down to Belmore, I'll put a decider on for That you. went down well. <laughs> it didn't go down too well. Everyone telling me to shut up again. But thankfully they put a three-game series on. Yeah, I know. And, now and you wouldn't what, believe it. The decider's in Townsville. Got. Yeah, it's... Yeah, it's yeah, Queensland get all the... Fun. And you know what? New South Wales will win in Melbourne and have a guess where the decider is in the men's. Suncorp! <laughs> just how it works out. Oh, I hope but it is. I just want two deciders. Hmm. I don't mind yeah, that. Yeah, I don't absolutely. mind that. That would be a win worth getting. You know, it, it took a lot out of the New South Wales girls, just looking at them after the game. It took a lot out of them. So mm. Queensland have certainly got momentum going into the decider. I, I felt like if it was a dry track, New South Wales would have won that game quite comfortably, um, but it wasn't. And that allowed Queensland to hang in there as tough as they did, but you know, nil all again. They go to uh, they go to Townsville, and anything can happen up there. Well, what, you know what it is. I've actually done a bit of investigating while I've been up here in Brisbane, and the re- you know how you're a young kid, you get your immunisations. There's an extra one up here in Queensland. It's yeah. the Never Say Die injection. Yeah, they put it into you when you're a baby, and it doesn't matter what sport, what gender, you're never beaten if you're a Queenslander. Yeah. That's why we love him. Hey, Anton on Ask Gus, this is a good question, actually. And I know his name's popped up a little bit. In fact, I think he might have been close enough to being picked last year. Asks, how come Dylan Walker doesn't come up in the Origin chat? I'm sure he does. Um, Dylan played a bit of Origin earlier in his career when he was primarily an outside back. He's made a career for himself now at the Warriors as a lock forward, as a ball playing lock forward, and able to fill in a few positions. Very experienced. Um, We've probably got a few of those players at origin level, your Cameron Murrays and your Asaya Yos and Jake Trebojevic's and those sort of players, you know, and more recently Cameron McGuinness. Um, I'd imagine he's been in the conversation, but, um, you know, he hasn't got the nod as yet. Um, but he, he would be more than capable. I don't think he'll be overawed by that sort of challenge and he's doing a wonderful job for the Warriors. Jerome asks... When are we getting an international calendar? We know where Origin's going to be played in 2028, but we don't even know when Australia will play New Zealand next. Yeah. Um, so I, I spoke to the Commission about this several years ago. Um, it was actually during the first COVID period. I got the opportunity to speak to the Commission. and We talked about um, the future of the game and what the game would look like in the next decade and the next 20 years. And you know, one of the things I was suggesting is buying the English Super League um, so that we had control of that, taking over the international board, which I felt was um, uh, didn't have the type of vision or 
power that it needed, investing in Pacific Islands, investing in New Zealand, um, investing in development here in Australia. There was a number of things we brought up. Not that they're all new ideas. Everyone thinks that way, but it was just an opportunity to, to talk about it. And uh, one of the things I said we should have is a, a rolling five-year calendar mm. for events for international and representative class football, which I think is a, uh, has been an under... Uh, an under-investment from our game for a long, long time. I started writing about the potential of Pacific Island tests 20 years ago um, when we started to get such a huge uh, rise in the numbers of Pacific Island players playing uh, our game at the elite level. Um, a lot of the Pacific Island players that play in our game now are second, third generation Australians um, born here. Their parents were born here. Um, you know, there are kids that are coming from the islands and coming from New Zealand all the time to come across here and get an opportunity to play in uh, play in rugby league systems and be a part of elite pathways. Um, the the NRL should be the EPL of World Rugby League. It should look after where this game is played into the future for the next 20, 30, 50 years mm. and what it looks like. Uh, the international... It should be controlling the whole calendar. It should be, it should be running the English Super League. We need England strong. We need... We need presence in Europe. You know, we need New Zealand strong. We need another franchise in New Zealand. We need, uh, we need international competition. The international competition needs to be put on a pedestal in our yearly calendar. That's why I say I think we play too much club football. I think the club season is too long. I think there are other, there are other forms of this game that 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 could earn the game a lot of revenue and a lot of status and. Um, and expansion and, and chances for expansion. I mean, they've yeah. they've started with the Las Vegas experiment. That's a that's a twenty thirty year project if they want to be really serious about it. But you know, like I said, it's going to be long after I'm dead and gone. But Jeez, someone's 30, got to start. Thirty years in Vegas, crikey. Mm. Um, Richard, Richard asks, good question. This one. My thoughts are that Brad Clyde is the best back rower I'd seen play. In your opinion. Is any current day player as good as Brad? Yeah, well, you're talking about different eras, uh, and certainly back in his era, Brad Clyde um, was uh, was brilliant, um, head and shoulders in the game, probably the the, um, the most athletic and um, uh, gifted back row forward um, that I saw during my time as a player and a coach. Um, he he kind of he was the first Bradley Clyde. There was nothing like a Bradley Clyde had come before him. Uh, prior to that, fellas like Ron Coots and uh, and those sort of fellas, Ron Coote would have been a similar thing, but he was more a wide-running player. Bradley Clyde was had such a uh, constitution for hard work and such yeah. a, an energy level and such a um, – he was, he, he was brilliantly athletic and tough in defence. And uh, I don't think I ever coached an origin game where Bradley Clyde played that we lost. Wow. I don't think we'd lost a game ever with Bradley Clyde in the side. New South Wales had you had two similar players because Brad Brad Mackay was very similar to that too, wasn't he? Yeah, Brad was. Uh, yeah, Brad was. Yeah, kind of similar. Brad was a, a back who ended up in the forwards. Um, he he too had uh, he too had a great work rate. He's a really good player, Brad Mackay. Um, was Luke Brad, Ricketson a bit like Brad Clyde? Brad Luke Ricketson was a tremendous player. He, he really was. He was one of my all time favourites. Uh, had a tremendous. He was playing at centre when I first went to the Roosters and he mm. played, I think, two games for us in the centres and I sat him down over a beer and I said, I'm going to change your life. He said, well, I it. <laughs> Not necessarily for the better. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you're going, to, you're going to move into the forwards. I don't know how your good looks are going to look in a few years' time, but um, uh, you're moving into the forwards. And I and he played for Australia. He was um, he was one of my favourite ever players. Yeah, they, they, You get players like that along the way. Um yeah, you know, Asai Yao is an extremely gifted athlete, um, high energy, high work rate. A lot of the players today, I, I wonder what a Bradley Clyde would have looked like under the training regimes and sports science and yeah, good call. Uh, and opportunities that they had these days. And that that goes for a lot of players back in those eras. Um, you know what they were was elite in their own era. Uh, it's hard to compare them to today's players, but yeah, Bradley Clyde certainly has a special place in this game. Um, and at the peak of his powers was the number one forward in the game. No risk about that. You know what? He was very handsome too. Bradley Clyde? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and Rico. They yeah. were a good looking team actually because Laurie, Laurie, was, Laurie was a bit of a heartthrob too, you know. I've got to be honest, man. I didn't look at football that way. <laughs> 
I don't know where you're going with this. <laughs> all right. Round 15, beanies for brain cancer round. You'll be able to buy your beanies out at all the grounds. And can I can I endorse the beanies as as a, a, an actual product, Gus? They are fantastic if you're a golfer in winter. Very warm. They keep your ears beautifully warm. So I, if you're a, even if you're not a golfer, they they're great if you go out to kids' sport at the weekend. So it's not the sort of thing you're going to buy and never wear again. That's what I'm getting at. Uh, Thursday footy. Oh, the Bermuda the Bermuda Triangle first up. Yeah. And the Dolphins, are, I don't think the Dolphins have played down in Cronulla before. Um, the Hammers I don't think back. the Dolphins have been out of Queensland. <laughs> Very all rarely. Season. Well, they Very went to rarely. New Zealand and they got their pants pulled down. Yeah. Um, so Nico's back in, and Atkinson, who's done a great job over the last six weeks, has gone to 18th man. The Hammer and Kafusi are back from their origin commitments. Mark Nichols goes to the bench, and Trey Fuller's out. Uh, Cody Nicarima comes back. He's actually going to captain the team this week. Um, interesting to see the front row for. For the Dolphins is Kenny Bromwich and Felice Kafusi, who are normally back rowers. Mm -hmm. A lot of back rowers are finding their way into the middle now. Uh, mm. I think we've got to stop calling them front rowers and back rowers and locks. And it's the way the coaches are using and rotating their forwards down the positions that they play. It's all a little bit interchangeable and middles and edges. What they're looking for is mobility. They're looking for speed. They're looking for mobility. Um, not so much. In, in, instead of size, but uh, they're able to get away with, if they haven't got big players, they're able to get away with it a little bit if they've got hard-working players. So, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see if that trend continues over the next couple of years, but certainly a trend at the moment. Um, this one here, Dolphins coming off the bye. Um, Shark, terrific last week against the Broncos. Uh, Wasn't that after a After a couple win? of disappointing mm -hmm. efforts. Um, they won without Nico and uh, came from behind in the second half with a resilient second 40 minutes. Back at home at the Bermuda Triangle, Dolphins away from home for one of the rare times this year, um, certainly getting out of Queensland. Um, I can't see anything but a shark victory there. Yes. Just when the questions start to pop up about Cronulla, they go and do that. But they've had two wins this year on the road in Melbourne and Brisbane without Nico Hines. Yeah. Yeah. They, they set the scene early in the season. They beat the Warriors early in the season away from home mm. in difficult conditions over there. So, yeah, look, every team, you can't be brilliant forever. You can't be brilliant every week. And I think the Panther game shocked everyone with the Sharks, particularly at Shark Park. Everyone built that up as a big top-of-the-table clash and the Sharks had just beaten the Storm and they'd just beaten the Roosters, you know, I think. Mm. And they got, to the, they got to the Panthers, which was the ultimate test, and they had them at home and everyone thought, mm. well, this is the night. What did it finish? 42 nil or something. Right? It was yep. just horrific. Uh, I think that put doubts in everyone's head, including the Sharks, because they went to Parramatta the next week and and, uh, and Parramatta Moses came back into the side with Gutherson, but Parramatta were too good for them there. And and we thought, well, I'll go to Brisbane and they could be losing three in a row. Well, they said, not on our watch. And they were really terrific in the second half and um, they blew the Broncos off the park and had a great win. So confidence... They get some confidence coming into this one. Uh, Nico Hines will be playing for his uh, number seven jersey, as will a number of other players in this game. Uh, I'm going to tip Shark to win that. Six o'clock Friday. This is the who knows game of the round. Who know? Actually, who knows what the Cowboys are going to do every week? Canberra hosting North Queensland down in Canberra, where it's going to be bloody cold. Hudson Young returns after his origin commitments. Talangi and Robson come back. They uh, they were rested last week and didn't back up from Origin, but uh, Young Harrison Edwards did a did a good job playing at hooker in a team that was badly uh, beaten. Jordan McLean comes back, Griffin named to the bench, so I think they're they're close enough to full strength. Uh, North Queensland, but down in Canberra, Gee, it's a bit different to Townsville this time of year. Certainly is uh, weather and venue should not affect professional footballers, but there is no doubt that uh, there is. A a huge advantage here to the Raiders under those mm -hmm. conditions on Friday night, and I'm not sure the Cowboys are going to enjoy it. Um, Cowboys need a win, but Raiders just keep finding a way to to keep ticking up the premiership ladder, and I think that they'll be too good at home. Okay. If they make the finals, Ricky Stewart's coach of the year. Lock it in. Friday night football from a core stadium. South Sydney versus Brisbane. There's a little bit of momentum behind the bunnies now. Oh, and 
in all this origin discussion, Gus, we didn't mention Cam Murray's back. Cam Murray, yeah, certainly trained this week. Um, has he been named? He's on the bench. He's in he's 16. On the bench. Yep. So he, he's going to play. Um, and with respect to Brisbane, what can I tell you? Oh, Xavier Willison in, Fletcher Baker out. Katani Staggs, sweet to play and with all the, the bait around. Uh, centres, a big game for Katani Staggs won't harm his chances. Did, can you can you sense an upset here? Certainly can. I'm just looking through it now. Uh, we didn't spend a lot of time on Origin talking about whether Latrell should be in or would be in. Um, he's obviously the name on everyone's lips at the moment. And a lot of people saying that he needs to be in the side. It's just like Latrell to come out and put in a five-star performance um, this week and and put it beyond doubt. Um, no. If he plays Walsh. well, do you think he'll be there? Do I think he'll be there? Yes. I tend to think he will. Okay. Have you been impressed with his recent form? His form's been good all year. There's been nothing wrong with his form. Well, I've seen a real energy about his footy in the last couple of but weeks that's, in particular. It's always on Latrell's terms. <laughs> yeah. And he's playing fullback for his club. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. who who are having a terrible season, and he's you know he's he's had his suspension issues and it's it as well. But he's uh, his actual numbers, his actual performances have been quite impressive. He's actually been influential um, mm. on the scoreboard from fullback. My question is, all right, why are we going to come play him in the centres, particularly against the opposition we're in? And will he defend up there? Can he defend up there? Will he defend up there for eighty minutes? Yes. Will he get back and run the ball in his own half of the field, which we need outside backs to do? Um, I guess that's why Maguire and Latrell are going to sit down at the reunion and have a, have a, have a bowl of fried rice together. <laughs> well, that's, that's if, the, if they yeah. do. I mean, there there is enough comment out there. You know, the, the uh, all the people that offer opinions on on rugby league that we have these days on podcasts and newspapers and TV shows. I mean, we've got panel shows everywhere and everyone's offering their opinion on it, uh, which is great for the game and great advertisement for the game. There seems to be a groundswell behind Latrell because they think he can solve the issue, which means they're looking at New South Wales attack more than they're looking at New South Wales defence. Yeah, he's got to make 25 tackles in the centres. Well, I'm sure they'll make him make 25 tackles. I'm sure they'll make him make 25 tackles yeah. is, is the thing if he comes up with them and... Yeah, you know, Latrell might do it. I don't know. If, if Latrell gets his dander up, he can do anything. If he decides that's what he's going to do, that's what he's going to do. No risk about that. And if he decides he's going to beat the Broncos, he'll beat the Broncos this week. He just will. Um, I like the Cody Walker, Jack White and Harves combination. I think that good. gave them a little bit more. I'm actually thinking South can beat them. Wow. I just think... Latrell might be in the mind to turn something on this week. Um, yeah, looking through. Let me look here. Let me look here. Uh, Do you know what? Bris- Brisbane want to be careful. They, they, they've found them. And there's a long way to go, but they yeah. are on the cusp of the eight. I mean, they're, they're not the way well, things are at the moment. There are no morals to get, even get there. What have we got on the ladder? We've got six or seven teams that have won seven games, haven't they? And Broncos are one of those. Broncos have won, yeah, so there's one, back, two, let three, me go back four, to the five. Yeah. So there's six, te- six, seven teams on seven wins. Two, three, four, five, six. Cowboys have won seven as well. Seven. There are seven teams that have won seven games, and Warriors and Seagulls have run six, won six in a draw. Mm. So that, those middle teams are all very, very level. They can all beat each other on any day, just depending on who's in the team and how they play. Um, it's very, very level at that at that stage, and Broncos, you know, they find themselves after 13 rounds mm. with seven wins, same as Roosters. You know, Roosters got a tremendous roster, and they're at seven wins too, so they need to get a little wriggle on if they want to be in the top four. If you're saying you've got to make the top four to win the comp, those two teams would have premiership aspirations. They, they need to get a wriggle on. Which makes this a massive game. Massive game. This one. Yeah, yeah. Massive. Yeah, I, I look. I'm gonna I'm gonna tip Bronco, but it would not surprise me if Cody and Latrell put on a show and then all weekend people are saying we'll throw him in the origin side. 
you know, just I can you can read the headlines already. Mm. Anyway, we'll see what Friday night brings. Is that our Channel Nine game? It is Friday night footy. Yeah, Friday night footy. Fatty will be up there with Cameron. It'll it's be, in Sydney. Uh, is it? Oh, it's in Sydney. You might be working. You better check your roster. I better check my roster. <laughs> <laughs> Three o'clock Saturday, we're off to Leichhardt. Oh, come on, Tigers. Now, he's moved Chorus out of halfback, and Talon De Silva comes in for his first game of the year against the Titans. There could be there could be 100 points here. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Um, I don't know what went on with the Titans last week. I, you know. How disappointing was that? Yeah, they were disappointing. They're, they're much, much better than that. And I think after what happened to uh, the Tigers down in Wollongong the other day, um, there'll be a reaction, I'm hoping. They do get a couple of players back. Aiden yeah, Caesar gee, comes back. Gee, they're missing some troops, though. Uh, Galvin's obviously injured. Sullivan's injured. Caesar's right. come back in. Uh, and that, 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 what about young Latu Fainu? Is he... Is he he must be injured too, is he? Because he's, I understand, he's, he's I understand he's having some hamstring issues. He, right. They're limiting his training and his time on the field at the moment, trying to get to the bottom of it. Uh, right. Look, I'll have to expect a bounce back from the Titans. And at the moment, you just can't be tipping the Tigers with any confidence. I see the betting market's actually quite close. Uh, where is it playing? It's at Leichhardt. The Leichhardt. Tigers' record at Leichhardt's terrible lately. Well, mind you, the record every quest not flashes. Well, they're going to need all the spirits of Leichhardt to come to them. Um, I'll go with Gold Coast to win that. Gus, this is the game of the millennium. Warriors hosting Melbourne, five thirty Saturday, and Sean Johnson's back for the Wars. Wow, they're getting a little bit of momentum. Yeah. So Johnson back into the halves to partner Tamara Martin. Chanel Harris Tavita stays on the bench. Freddie Lussick drops out. And RTS is on the, the wider bench. So they could be back to what is pretty much full strength. Mm. Um, with respect to Melbourne, obviously there remains no Cameron Munster. Uh, Jerome Hughes is in the halves. No Pappy. Farlongo stays at fullback. Incidentally, I understand Munster might be like another nine weeks away. Yeah. Long, long term. Well, I think they'll give him as long as they can. They'll get him ready for the finals. Mm. I don't think there's any reason to come back and risk him re-injuring before the finals. Mm. And I think... I think Cleary too. I don't think Penrith will risk Cleary until they, you know, if, if somehow they got themselves in a position where they might risk losing their top four spot, but I don't think that's going to happen. Mm. I think while they're winning, they might keep giving him extra time because you want to get it 100% right and you want him there for the big games. Uh, How good Warriors, a game this one, though? Ooh. Warriors, I think, will win this one. Uh -huh. uh, I can just see a little bit of a resurgence there and the fact that the halfback now comes back. Um, Sean Johnson, um, yeah, I think I think Warriors will win that. Okay, Saturday night, 5.30, it, it's a great game, and another sellout crowd. 5.30, Combank, well, Mitch Moses can probably seal the deal, and if he stands up against the Roosters with Kiri and Walker there, you can probably lock him into the number seven. Para uh, Roosters from Combank, Mike Acevo's back on the wing. Now, Jermaine Hop, could, there's a, he's got a little issue. I think he's got a nerve problem in his neck, and Trent Barrett actually said... Uh, after last week, that he probably shouldn't have played. Shouldn't have played, yeah. That'll be interesting with with an eye on origin. Um, and for the Roosters, no Brandon Smith, obviously, uh, and doubts about where he's at with the club. Connor Watson's going to play at hooker. Yeah, they've actually been really impressive when Connor Watson goes to hooker, uh, be it all that he was coming off the bench. Connor Watson can play his way into the New South Wales side with a strong performance here. And as I said previously, both the Broncos and the Roosters need to get a little bit of a wriggle on. Um, sort of sitting there on seven wins. It hasn't been bad, but it hasn't been great either. I raised the thing on 100% footy the other night. You know, at the halfway mark, we're doing a half-season review. And I said, one of the things that hasn't been discussed is that um, the four teams that went to Las Vegas early season got themselves up to play at Las Vegas. Hmm. Um, so you're talking Roosters, Broncos, South and Manly. When you look at it the first half of the season, that you could all say they've probably underperformed on what was expected. Mm. They're all down on where we would have anticipated they'd be. Now, if I'm one of those teams or two of those teams, you'd say, well, it's... But the fact that all four yeah. haven't come up like we thought they would or, or certainly aren't... Or their position on the ladder isn't where we thought they'd be. Um, 
Whether or not that's a factor, it might be a small factor, but it's worth looking at. It's worth considering. We've all been sort of watching that to see how they, they come up after the Las Vegas trip, but yeah. uh, well, it might be show. no factor at all. It just might be a coincidence. But the fact that all four teams are probably aren't where they where we would expect them to be, um, obviously, you know, the Seals have had their problems losing to Rojevic and those sorts of things. And Makes you so, wonder why teams are lining up for a trip to Vegas then. Well, I know why they're lining up for a trip to Vegas. Why? Blackjack? No, it's good money, good profile, good energy. What's, what's good? But they're not getting paid to go, are they? I think they do, yeah. Do they? I didn't think they did. Yeah. I'm sure they will be. Well, I think you'd know. Why wouldn't they? <laughs> you'd know. <laughs> Where are you going? Well, we're monitoring the situation. <laughs> Develop, more developments as they come to head. Um, where are we? Warriors oh, yeah, Parramatta. Uh, Parramatta, uh, Parramatta Roosters. Roosters. Yeah, well, I favour Rooster. Okay. <sighs> this is a good one. This is a throwback, this game. Two o'clock. There's some good games this week. Manly Dragons. Four Pines Brookie. I just keep... Someone keeps nagging, nagging away at me. I'm saying that Manly could come good in this comp. Uh, Ola Kawadu has been named to start despite the calf last week. More concern, of course, for Michael Maguire. Nathan Brown's been named to start at prop. Alloy A suspended. What, another bloke sticking his leg. How many trips are there this year? Yeah. What are they doing? Uh, Bullimore comes to the bench. And no, the Dragons have had pretty much the same 17 for the last little while now. And, and they're going pretty good. Big, aggressive side. Um, keep finding enough games to win to keep themselves motivated in the competition. This is a big one, Sunday afternoon at Brookvale Oval, or Four Pines, what it's called now. But Four uh, Pines Park, but I call it Four Pines Brookie, because you can't take the Brookie out of Brookvale. 100%. Uh, really interesting one, this one. Really interesting. I'm going to tip, just because it's Sunday at Brookvale, I'm going to tip Seagull, mm -hmm. but with no confidence whatsoever. Right. I think... Dragons will really take that down to the wire, if not win. That'll be another sellout. It will be. Only place to be. By the way, I just got a note from Cameron George at the Warriors. So they sold that game out um, against Melbourne two weeks ago. They've already sold out the Broncos game at the end of the month. And the Super Rugby has moved their semi-final game between the Hurricanes and the Chiefs from Saturday night yep. so they don't clash with the Warriors. So yeah, rugby is moving schedules to not clash with Rugby League in New Zealand. They're huge, the Wars. The Wars are huge. And I'm telling you, the game should cap capitalise on this because rugby's there for the taking in New Zealand. There is a groundswell of support for the Wars. There is an opportunity for development of players and investment in the game. There's opportunity for another NRL team to be playing out of Auckland, um, New Zealand. I think New Zealand is somewhere that we really should be focusing on. Hmm. Uh, but that's just me. They're a brilliantly run club too. I, I take my hat off to what those those guys over at the Warriors are doing. They've been absolutely outstanding. Wonderful and they're doing favorite. a great job for the game. Uh, Newcastle Penrith, our Sunday footy game. Bradman Best is back. Another one that's that's come back in. Now, Fletcher Sharp had a had a good game on debut. And I see David Armstrong having recommitted to Newcastle once out. I think he wants to go to England. He's heading to Lee, I believe. Right. Uh, Lee Centurions, yeah. That's Young strange. Fletcher Sharp is a kid that I've admired for a long time. I've been watching him in the junior rep football for three years now, and uh, he's a very good young player. And he was good on debut down there at Melbourne the other day, and they really took Melbourne to the wire, didn't they? Yep. Uh, kept finding a way to get themselves back in the game, and a high-scoring affair. When you're scoring that number of points against a Melbourne Storm side, you're doing something right. They've obviously got that part of it there. Uh, Panthers... I don't think Panthers are going brilliantly. They've obviously got players missing and their side's changing a bit around origin time at different areas. They've got a handy fullback coming back this week, though. Yeah, Dylan. Do you think back. he'll be there in game two? I think if he gets through this one, he'll be there. Yeah. Otherwise, why did they pick him in game one? Yep. Yeah. I, yeah. It's going to be... It's going to be... I think everyone's waiting to see what they do with the New South Wales side. Can't pick your team until the medical, though. They're going to get through this round. <laughs> Jeez, they need a bit of luck. Yep. Everyone's fallen over. Yep. So we'll go with uh, the defending premiers to win there. So we're going to go Shark over Dolphin, Raider over Cowboy, Bronco over Rabbit. Question mark. Don't know. Question mm -hmm. mark.
Bronco. I'm going to go Titan over Tiger. Warrior to beat Storm. Rooster to beat Eel. Mm -hmm. Sea Eagle to beat Dragon. Panther to beat Knight. Very That's good. Will be. So I'm off to the pool shortly. Today, women's 200 freestyle. Yep. Molly O'Callaghan, Ariane Titmus. Um, How fast can they go? I mean, every time we have swimming, we break world records. I know. I was thinking about the same How thing. How fast can they go? I know. I know. Where will it end? I don't know. There was a race, a race that was swum the other day where Dawn Fraser was the previous world record holder and the world record has come down such that they're actually a lap faster now than they were than when Dawn was swimming. Yeah. But no, I, that's a great question. But uh, some stars I mean, on show. Where, 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 where does it end? You jump in and touch the other end. I don't know. Where does it end? Yeah, I know. I know. Well, you, you, can't know, keep, you can't keep breaking records. Well, they're coming down by such minuscule amounts that I, that's, that, that's what the argument is. But eventually... <laughs> Eventually, they'll just jump in and touch the end. You're right. But, you know, all the suit, remember all the super suits they had at one stage back in the late yeah. 2000s? Oh, there's only one, or oh, there's two world records still standing from that era. Yeah. So they're even going faster than that. Um, Cameron McAvoy in the 50 freestyle today. And tonight, Gus, there is a celebrity or legends relay. So here's the lineup Clint Stanaway host weekend today. Jonathan Thurston, I'm told JT can't swim. I hope he jumps in the shallow end. Um, but he's he's such he's such a competitor. He's probably going to go to high performance swimming lessons in the mm. lead up to this. Michelle Payne, Melbourne right. Cup winning jockey. Yep. Drew Mitchell, who's um, from Wallaby. Kerry Pothouse, gold medal beach volleyballer. Sylvia Jeffries. Now Millie Elliott swimming, and we we saw her do those Origin challenges. Like yeah. she'll win. Yeah, she, she'll win it. Yeah, she's a great athlete. But the fly and the ointment. Is Carl Stefanovic. <laughs> What's he, the starter? <laughs> no, he's swimming. Swimming. He might sink. Mm. <laughs> yes. So that's what's now, going on. Now, who would today. put him up to that? Why uh, would he be doing that? I don't know. I think it's called public relations. Thanks, Gus. I'll, uh, I'll see you next week when I'm back in town. Enjoy your swimming. This year, NRL on 9 is your one stop shop for all footy. That's right, Freddie. Not about the highlights, action. Seven days a week. Billy and Gus podcast, get that on your drive on the way home. Immortal behaviour. Grab a seat on the couch for that. And of course, my favourite, Fred in the Oak. The best footy brains, the biggest games. Don't trust the algorithm. Subscribe to NRL on 9 and get all your entertainment there.